In this video, we'll talk a little bit more about decision tree classifiers and their representational power. In particular, decision trees define disjunctive concepts. Decision trees were first proposed by cognitive psychologists as ways of representing human disjunctive concepts. And algorithms for learning decision trees were proposed as models of human concept learning. In any case, let's turn our attention to how decision trees represent disjunctive concepts. Each path in a decision tree, and I've highlighted four here, represents a conjunction of conditions. The four paths that I've highlighted here are all paths that end in a leaf labeled rented. So each path that I've highlighted here represents a conjunction of conditions in which rented is true. So for example, I've highlighted one path in purple. So this path claims that one would rent it if Ebert gave a thumbs down, it was a sci-fi, and the movie included a big star. Wise for the path labeled green, and this corresponds to the very last clause highlighted in green at the bottom of the screen. Ebert said yes, Siskel said yes, it was a romance, and it was a black and white. That was another condition in which the model suggests that one would rent a movie. All four of those paths and you disjoin them, you get a disjunctive normal form concept, which represents the situation in which the model would assert that a user would rent a movie. You can do the same thing for or not rent it. Take a look at this decision tree, the same as the earlier one, but I've highlighted the not rent it conditions. Come up with a disjunctive normal form in F representation for not rent it. And when you think you've got it, restart the video for the answer. So at the bottom you see a disjunctive normal form representation for not rented. This is a disjunction of the four paths, the not rented leaves. Here are the two disjunctive normal form representations for both rented and not rented. I've just rewritten them very slightly, replacing the word or with the V inclusive or symbol and with the cone and symbol. I've also replaced the variable value pairs with more typical propositional symbol representations. For example, Ebert equals 1 would simply be replaced by the proposition Ebert, lowercase e. Ebert equal negative 1 would be replaced by not Ebert or tilde Ebert. So very simple rewriting to put this back into the syntax of propositional logic. Now, as other sources will point out, decision trees are equivalent to very related representations, like logic programs. This is from Poole and Mackworth. You'll see a very simple decision tree in the top right, which is the model of when somebody will read a blog post or not. If the blog post is too long, they skip it, not read. If it's short and the thread is new, that corresponds to read, etc. And you can take a look at the logic program in the body of the slide, it's got two clauses for skips and two clauses for reads. This correspond to the rented, not rented labels that we had in the earlier example. Collectively, you could take the two reads clauses, combine them with a disjunction, and you would have a characterization of what this decision tree asserted as the conditions under which someone would read a blog post. And the same with skips. At the bottom, you see, or with negation as failure. This simply means that all we need to do really is characters in this example, the conditions under which someone would read the blog post, leaving out an explicit representation of when they would not read it. So if a new data does not satisfy either of those reads conditions, it must be a situation in which the person would skip. And this follows from a very property of decision trees. And that property is the decision tree covers all the possible data defined over the tree's variables. So here I've rewritten propositional disjunctive normal form representations for rented at the top and not rented at the bottom in red. And for the coverage to be complete, negating the positive rented condition should leave us with the same concept as not rented. Another important characteristic of decision trees is that they explicitly encode context. And this can be quite nice from a knowledge representation standpoint. In this particular decision tree, the subtree to the left corresponding to the situation in which Ebert doesn't like something. This defines a situation in which some variables dominate and some rules dominate, sci-fi and big star, for example. Whereas the other subtree, 
characterizes the situation in which Ebert does like something. And in that space, other variables dominate and other rules dominate. So this characteristic of explicitly encoding context can be quite nice, and we can apply it recursively so that deep subtrees in the decision tree correspond to very specialized contexts. Finally, there are different kinds of variables that we could use to represent knowledge. Very often these variables will be low-level descriptive variables, like whether the movie is in black and white. We can even allow continuously valued variables, though, whether the runtime, for example, is less than 90 minutes or greater than or equal to 90 minutes, which might be important in characterizing the behavior of certain users who are impatient with longer movies, for example. Some variables defined by functions over yet other variables. So, for example, we might define a feature which is the illogical equivalence of two other binary variables. Or, if we have continuously valued variables, we might define higher order expressions of those variables, perhaps the square of one of the variables or the product of two continuously valued variables. And finally, the kinds of features I'm most interesting are variables with values that are defined by complex and unknown functions of other variables. When a movie's genre is identified, for example, by movie categorizers, that genre is a very high order feature which somebody is determining by looking at the basic features of a movie and translating into a very high level characterization like western or comedy or some other kind of drama. That's a non-trivial process. We don't know what's going on inside that identifier's brain, and so it represents an unknown function as well. Human recommendations coming from experts like Siskel and Ebert, or our friends on Facebook. You can think of friend as a complex, unknown function. That who is making recommendations based on processes that we don't even understand, but who we as consumers or machine learning algorithms can use as higher order features that would be very valuable in identifying situations in which it would be desirable to go to a movie or not. And finally, we can also rely on artificially intelligent recommender systems like those found on Netflix and iTunes. Again, we don't know those functions. They're proprietary, undoubtedly. But nonetheless, they represent complex functions that give output that we as users can then use or machine learning algorithms can use. In fact, I'd be very surprised if recommender systems like Netflix and iTunes weren't perhaps using the recommendations of their or the recommendations of human reviewers to actually come up with their recommendations. It wouldn't be very hard if you had the data to know that movies I liked would correspond to the movies that Ebert liked. And you should recommend to me any movie that Ebert gave a thumbs up to.